1980, when I was uh, five, actually for, for my fifth birthday, my parents and I decided that we would go to a local theme park. Um, it was a hot day, it was uh, in July, and uh, at the time, um, we owned this fantastic car here. It's a blue maxi, um, legendary in the world of British automobiles. One of the features um, of the Blue Maxi um, was the fact that it had black plastic seats, um, which did mean in the middle of the summer, if you left the car in the, uh, not under the shade, those seats got up to the temperature of the sun. So, which caused a problem uh, if you were like us boys where you like to wear shorts. So one of the things that we insisted our father did was always park in the shade. So we, whenever we got to a car park, he'd try and get as near to the entrance as we could, and we'd say, no, 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 over there's a tree there, you know, don't forget, we, want, we like the skin on the back of our legs, we'd tell him. So he'd drive around, and one day in Thorpe Park, um, we were driving around, and we came across this uh, decommissioned um, uh, jet fighter plane uh, in the corner of the car park. Now, this was not inside Thorpe Park at all. We hadn't paid by the time we got to this point. We were still in the car park. It was just really a kind of ornamental car park filler, if you like. And instantly, us three boys had just eyes opened up, and this was, this was the most amazing thing we'd ever seen. We spent the entire day playing on this jet fighter plane. You can see us having lunch there. We literally spent the entire day. We were, obviously, we were jet fighter pilots, and then we were chasing aliens, and we were submarine captains, and then we were anything and everything that we could possibly think of existed within this plane. At the end of the day, we packed everything up and we went home and we actually didn't pay Thorpe Park a single penny. Um, so if Thorpe Park had known this, they'd have obviously put it inside. This wasn't designed for children. This wasn't designed to be something that would take up our activities. But children have this inherent ability to be able to find play in everything and anything that they come across. So when I heard a stat um, that I think it was 32% of 8 to 12-year-olds are on Facebook in the UK, I instantly got to this scenario. Facebook isn't designed for children. It's not designed for people under 13. Facebook genuinely doesn't want under 13s on there, yet under 13s are really drawn to it. And I really wanted to understand why. And I think if you want to try and understand why children are drawn to something, you need to understand who they are, who children are, what their needs are, and what motivates them, and therefore understand what it is the thing that they are drawn to is fulfilling, what needs are it satiating. So this started me on a journey to try and really begin to understand children, children's needs, who they are, what they stand for, and what motivates them. And when we think about children, um, a lot of us think kind of there's a very broad range, and some people like to lump kind of under eights together, or kind of eight to twelves together, or six to eleven year olds together, and we have children, and we have tweens, and we have a whole variety of different uh, terminology. But for us, and you're kind of looking around, kind of one up to around the age of kind of 12, 13, we split this down into about six different categories. We've got the younger age, um, where it is the kind of copycat uh, style. We then have the role player. We then have the control freak, the tribal sharer, the identity explorer, and the confident consumer. And this is just within that kind of two to kind of 13, 14. And one of the things I really don't like doing is putting an age on these, because I don't think that's really right. I think children just go through these stages of development. And what we base these development stages on is a child's desire. We, we think that if a child has got roof over their head, they're, they're well fed, they've got love and support from those who should love and support them, that ultimately the real thing that they're trying to do in this age is find out who they are and what they mean and how they fit into society. So this is what we've, how we've broken this down. What are those key stages of identity development that children are going through? And now there's only three that I'm really going to focus on today. That's 6 to 12, 6 to 11-year-old age range. There's a control freak, the tribal share, and the identity explorer. They're the interesting ones because they're the tweens. They're not children, they're not teens, they're not adults. Kind of uh, very, very different, very uh, kind of changing. So these are the ones that, that I always find very interesting. So zooming in on those. We've got those three. Um, we've got the control freak. Now, for the control freak, it's really important to think about the control freak. The world is scary for them. They're six, they're seven, they're eight, they're kind of around that age. And all of a sudden, they start realizing that, for example, that there are actions, that there are consequences to their actions, that their parents can't actually change everything that they think that they can. Pets die, grandparents die, their parents might die, their parents might argue. Actually, life all of a sudden becomes quite scary for these children. So what they naturally try and do is create a kind of cordoned off world that they can control. And that's where the kind of control freak comes in. So the way that they, their, their kind of control manifests itself is they do three key things, or these are the three things that, that we've seen quite a lot. They start to collect 
They start to nurture things, and they start to customize things. Um, actually, I'm, there's a quote here. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a clunky quote, so bear with me. Professor McKinley, very, very smart guy, but sentence structure was, was, was tough for me. So, but the quote is, for some, the satisfaction of collecting things comes from experimenting with arranging, rearranging, and classifying parts of a big world out there, which can serve as a means of control to elicit a comfort zone in one's life. Paraphrased, if you can collect things like your match attacks or like, for example, the background here, marbles, which is something I was obsessed with with a child, I uh, obsessively collected marbles. If you can create a small little world of your collection, things that you put in, things that you share out, all of a sudden you feel that you've got control over something. Not the big world out there, but control over something. Nurturing is the next thing we see in kids. So pets, for example, really six, seven, eight-year-olds are really start loving to nurture pets. Uh, customizing, changing how their bedroom looks, putting stickers on their books, uh, changing the way that they, that they look and the way that their environment, particularly their bedroom is. So these are all uh, traits, behaviors, if you like, that manifest themselves in that control freak phase. And when you start thinking about online and digital, and you know, as somebody who kind of does a lot of work in the kind of digital and, and, and experiential side, we see this in things like Club Penguin, for example, which is the puffles over on, the, uh, over on your left, um, and the, the obsession that children have to collect as many of these as they can and look after these. A lot of the virtual worlds, you have a pet that you look after and nurture. So this is a, a moshi in the middle there that you look after and you nurture. And a lot of the virtual worlds all have environments within which you live which you can customize and you can change and you can make uh, much more about you. So that's the control freak. Tribal sharer is the middle one. Now, the interesting difference between a control freak and a tribal sharer is there's a line between the two, and that line is the social chasm. This is a very, very large psychological, cognitive, developmental stage of a child. Because before they get to this point, they're really all about me. Who am I? What am I like? What are the sort of things that I enjoy doing? A lot of play patterns you see in children under um, this kind of in, the control freak and younger is very much a kind of solo play where they play with other kids. They kind of within their own world, within their environment, the, the kind of socialising of children isn't really happening until you get to this social chasm, as I call it, where you jump across into that tribal sharer, where all of a sudden you're not so much worried about who you are and what you stand for, but you're worried about how you fit into the society as a whole, how you fit into that tribe of which you're a member. So all of a sudden, they have a very different outlook on life. They're not trying to understand who I am. They're trying to understand how I fit in. And they are trying to fit in. So children, when they get that tri tri um, tribal sharing phase, they're trying to fit in. They're trying to understand that, um, that time. It's around kind of 8, 9, 10, as I say. I don't really like to, to kind of give it an age. It's also worth noting that those stages of development, it's, it's very kind of non-linear. Children can go into one and then they can feel confident on some days and they can take a step into a certain um, personality and then they can have their confidence knocked and they can go back down into one. Some children stay much longer in some phases than others. Some just skim through and, and kind of it's much more transient. Also, those stages, they continue. Um, it's not necessarily that as soon as a child comes out of the control freak, they no longer like nurturing and collecting things. I still like collecting things. Um, you know, I'm still an obsessive control freak just as much as, uh, as, much as a six-year-old child is. So we never kind of grow out of these stages. So what they try and do when they fit in, they try and badge themselves, a lot of communication, a lot of peer comparison as well. So badging, looking at badging. Now, badging, again, is something that we see in the adult world. You look at the, the terraces of Old Trafford, um, and you can see everybody wearing exactly the same T-shirt supporting Manchester United. You look, at the, uh, you, know, you look at the bumper stickers, and everyone's kind of sticking on their bumpers who they are and what they stand for. And you know, obviously, in America, there's a big election going on, and you'll have people sticking out the front of their houses. I belong to Tribe Obama, or I belong to Tribe, tribe Romney. You, know, you see it everywhere, and children are exactly the same. They belong to a tribe. And they're trying to make sure that the other members of their tribe know who they are and that they're a member of that tribe. And they can do that from the music that they like. They can do that from the style of clothes that they wear, the type of books that they read. But ultimately, what they're trying to do here is signal to the rest of the tribe, hey, I'm with you. You're in my tribe. I like you. The second stage, communication. They want to constantly make sure that they're not forgotten. They don't want to be the member of the tribe that doesn't necessarily hook in with everybody else and ends up getting forgotten and sidelined. So there's a constant communication. 
And lastly, and this is slightly more of a boy trait than a girl trait, but we see a lot of peer comparisons. People saying, you know, where do I fit in within the tribe? So boys, for example, they're the first ones to go, who's the fastest within our tribe? Or who's the tallest? Or who's the cleverest? Or who can throw the furthest? And, and that's really a lot of what that is about, is just trying to understand, okay, I understand my tribe now. How do I fit in within that tribe? And what is the hierarchy within that? So when you start looking online, look at things like badging, that's when children start doing things like they, they would change their profile pictures on the social networks that they do to kind of show the, who they're supporting. It's around this age that, despite the fact that they're not allowed, a lot of kids are going onto Facebook. And the way they badge themselves on Facebook is, is by the things that they like. So you'll see eight, nine, and ten-year-olds, what they're doing when they're on Facebook is they're not necessarily doing a lot of stuff that we're doing, but they're going around liking things, or they're liking TV shows, or they're liking statements. You know, that they, I like Marmite, or I didn't realize that, uh, that, that, that the actor in Hannah Montana is 30 years old, and, you know, they're kind of, I hate waiting up for school. And basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, look, this is who I am. This is who, how I define myself from my likes. Communication, really important. Whenever we do qual sessions, we do qual sessions all the time. We get groups of kids in together, and you know they'll often log on. Um, you know, while we're kind of chatting to them, they have a PC, and we just really just sit back and watch what they do. And and uh, a lot of times they'll kind of jump on and log onto Facebook. And as soon as they do, qual sessions over because they're friends and messaging them. What's your? Oh, what are you doing? What's up? And instantly they're having ten different conversations with twenty different people, and and it's all kind of goes crazy. And it's that constant desire to be communicating with each other, even at that younger age. Things like uh, BlackBerry that does very, very well because it's a very quick and easy way of the BBM messenger is a lot of things that we're seeing kids using a lot of. And then finally, peer comparison, things like leaderboards you know, and, and games. You know, and um, we do a lot of stuff where um, you know, children love to see what their score is so that they can instantly compare with their friends. You know, but it's not just necessarily a, a comparison like that. They like to kind of show off and, and one-upmanship just as much as everybody else here does. So we did a qual session with a 10 um, and 11-year-old um, uh, triad boys. And one of the boys updated his status in the qual session, and he wrote, has a girlfriend. And the only reason he did that is because the other two didn't have a girlfriend. You know, there's no way that they could come back from that. So instantly, he was the one with the girlfriend, and they were the ones without the girlfriend. So they're using social media to try and understand um, how they compare with others. The final group I want to talk about um, are our identity explorers. Now, the identity explorer group is slightly different from the others because this really is one of the ones where some children really like to trial new identities and really like to kind of test who they are and what they stand for. And other kids aren't quite so confident with that. I think all children go through this to a, develop, to, to a degree because obviously they need to test different identities to understand what's the one they're most happy with or which tribe they're most comfortable with. The way I think of identity explorers is, is um, if you see a, a flock of starlings and they're all kind of flying around each other, that's very much like the tribe that you see within tribal sharers. There's not really ever a leader. We hear about these kind of play, like playground influences, but really there's not really a leader. Everyone's kind of following everybody else and following the fads and trends that everybody else is following. Then you get one starling that kind of comes out and flies around and comes back in again. And for me, they're the identity explorers. They're the ones that... They're in this tribe, they're happy, but they just want to try something else, just want to experiment, see what's going on, and see how things are. So for these guys, for these identity explorers, testing new identities is what they're all about. Now, the really interesting thing is, before the world of digital, and before they could engage um, in online environments, the way they used to be able to do that was they had different circles of friends. So they'd have a group of friends that they were friends with in Girl Guides, they'd have a group of friends that they were friends with through church group, and they'd have a group of friends that they were friends with with gymnastics, and they could be different in each of those different scenarios. And this is really, really important because children don't know who they are or what they want to be. So, for example, in the Girl Guides, it could be that, you know, I want to be the kind of slightly street edgy one, and that's, that's something that I want to trial in that. However, in the church group, I want to trial something a bit more glamorous. And then maybe in the gymnastics group, I want to be the rock chick. But you can't then kind of cross over, and it gets quite confusing. And, and so when digital came along, what happened was is the different children use different social networks. So for example, a lot of times what we see is that they'll have a group of friends that they are friends with at Girl Guides will be their friends that they are friends with on Habbo. Um, or a group of friends that they're friends with from church will be a group of friends that they're friends with on Stardoll, and so on and so on. 
And what they'll do is they'll test those different identities within those different tribes. They'll trial things out. They'll, they'll do different things. And they go, you know what? I kind of quite like that idea of the rock chick. I might take that over to this tribe and see how it fits there. And maybe I'll be someone who leads it, or maybe I'll be, just be someone who kind of sits in there with everybody else. So they're the kind of three that I really want to talk through today. But the one thing I want to leave you with is if you want to engage with children, you want to have a good, meaningful conversation with them, you've really got to understand who they are, and you've got to understand what they are trying to achieve. If you can understand that, and you can understand how you can help them, then you're going to have a really effective engagement and a long-term sustainable relationship with your audience. Thank you very much.